Welcome, my friends! In mathematics, usually we do not allow the square root of negative numbers. But there is a whole realm of numbers called imaginary numbers that involves the square root of negative numbers. We define i squared as equaling negative 1. Now, technically, there is no real number that can be squared to get negative 1, which is why we call i an imaginary number. Now, if we take the square root of both sides, you might think that we should get i is equal to plus or minus the square root of negative 1. But usually we don't consider the plus or minus here, since we are already kind of in imaginary land anyways. Usually you see i expressed as the positive square root of negative 1, although technically the definition of i comes from i squared equaling negative 1. Since i is equal to the square root of negative 1, if you ever have the square root of a negative number in your problem, you can replace it with i. Let's look at an example. Say you have the square root of negative 10. This could be rewritten as the square root of negative 1 times 10. We just stated that the square root of negative 1 is i, which we can pull out of the square root. So this can be simplified as i times the square root of 10. Let's try another one. We have the square root of negative 44. This can be rewritten as the square root of negative 1 times 44. The negative 1 can be taken out as i, leaving us with i times the square root of 44. But this isn't fully simplified. We can break the square root of 44 into the square root of 11 times 4. 4 is a perfect square, and the square root of 4 is 2, which can be taken out. Our final answer is 2i square root 11. Now, don't get confused. Something like negative square root of 100 is not an imaginary number. The negative sign needs to be inside the square root for us to need to involve i. The square root of 100 is just 10, so this simplifies to negative 10. It gets a little bit interesting when you start to think about powers of i. If you have i to the 0th power, that's the same thing as positive 1. We know that anything to the 0 power, other than 0, should equal 1, and i to the 0 power also follows that rule. We have already stated that i to the 1st power is equal to the square root of negative 1, but usually you will write it as just i rather than the square root of negative 1. Our definition already stated that i squared is equal to negative 1, so we have that for our second power of i. For i to the third power, that's the same thing as i to the second power times i. Well, i to the second power is equal to negative 1, so i squared times i must be negative 1 times i, or simply just negative i. What about i to the fourth power? Well, that's equal to i squared times i squared, but we already know that i squared is equal to negative 1. Therefore, i to the fourth is just negative 1 times negative 1, which is equal to positive 1. It turns out from here, i just cycles through the same four values of i, negative 1, negative i, 1, i, negative 1, negative i, 1, forever and ever as we increase the power on i. Let's do a few more so you can see the pattern. i to the fifth power is i to the fourth times i, or 1 times i, which is just i i to the 6th is i to the 4th times i squared, but again, i to the 4th is just 1, and we know that i squared is negative 1, which means we have 1 times negative 1, which is equal to negative 1. i to the 7th is equal to i to the 4th times i to the 3rd, but i to the 4th is 1, and i to the 3rd is negative i, so we have 1 times negative i, which is equal to negative i. i to the 8th is just i to the 4th times i to the 4th, which is just 1 times 1, which of course is 1. So we see i goes in a cycle of i, negative 1, negative i, 1, i, negative 1, negative i, 1, forever and ever and ever, every 4 powers. Now if you are given a higher power of i, such as i to the 37th power, there are a few ways you could simplify it. My preferred method is to remember that i to the 4th power, as well as i to the 8th power, i to the 12th power, or i to any multiple of 4 power is equal to 1. So in this case, you could rewrite the problem as i to the 36th power times i, and since 36 is a multiple of 4, 
it will just be 1. So we have 1 times i, which is equal to i. Let's try another one. i to the 30th can be broken up into i to the 28th times i squared. 28 is a multiple of 4, so i to the 28th must be equal to 1. So we are left with i squared, which we already know is equal to negative 1. We can add or subtract complex numbers as if i was a variable. For example, consider negative 5 plus 2i minus negative 2 plus 4i. We can distribute the negative sign so that we have negative 5 plus 2i plus 2 minus 4i. We can then combine the negative 5 and 2 to get negative 3, and we can combine the 2i and negative 4i to get negative 2i. Our answer is negative 3 minus 2i. We call this a complex number as there is both a real part, the negative 3, and an imaginary part, the negative 2i. Generally, we express complex numbers in the form a plus bi, where a is the real number and bi is the imaginary number. In our case, a equals negative 3 and b equals negative 2. This is what we call the standard form of a complex number. Let's try multiplying complex numbers. We have negative 4 minus 5i times 3 plus 2i. We can FOIL this out, which gives us negative 12 for the first terms, negative 8i for the outer terms, negative 15i for the inner terms, and negative 10i squared for the last terms. We know that i squared is equal to negative 1, so we can rewrite this as negative 12 minus 8i minus 15i minus 10 times negative 1. This can again be rewritten as negative 12 minus 8i minus 15i plus 10. Now we can combine our real and imaginary components. Negative 12 plus 10 is negative 2, and negative 8i minus 15i is negative 23i. Altogether, we have negative 2 minus 23i, which is in standard form, a plus bi. Alright my friends, that completes our discussion of imaginary numbers.